English. Nice to be here tonight. Uh, I am a uh, sitting reparations commissioner uh, right now for the uh, city of St. Paul reparations commission, uh, St. Paul recovery act commission. And uh, just glad to be here tonight. Uh, nice energetic crowd. And well, um, and Hello, Jamila. Glad you could make it. So we have a lot of commissioners here tonight, which is really exciting um, and really honored to have uh, Linda Mann from the African-American Redress Network here. Uh, the African-American Redress Network is a collaboration, I believe, between Columbia University, Howard University, and Thurgood Marshall University. Um, Ms. Mann has been doing a lot of research on um, getting input, a lot of input from the descendants uh, of US chattel slavery and going around the country and talking and doing work on the commissions around the country. So she, I'm gonna hand it over to her and let her explain it a little better, but thank you so much for being here. Hi everyone, it's nice to be here. And I feel as if Trey and I have similar backgrounds on our cameras. We both have doors behind us. <laughs> um, but if it's my understanding, I'd, I'd actually like to see a show of hand. How many of you are within the government system? If you're working within a commission or council or have some sort of, if you could raise your hand. I was, yeah. Okay. So it looks like we have like three, four, three or four. I'm a concerned citizen unelected. Okay. And how many, how many, it looks like we have North Dakota, Minnesota, how many of you are actually um, it, are involved in reparations? Is everybody involved in reparations in their states? Everyone on these calls. Okay, great. And some of you would consider yourself allies and then other of others like Imani are advancing reparations for their communities their descendant communities, correct? Okay, I just wanted to get a sense um, of where everybody is on this, on this call and to make sure I can be responsive to what would be helpful to this team. Um, first of all, let me just thank everyone. It's always nice to be in company with others that are committed to this work. Um, it's also really good to be in collaboration with um, others, period, on this work, because oftentimes individuals work in silos. And we just had the South, we have a we have regional meetings, and I'll, I should back up a little bit. Okay, my name is Linda Mann. <laughs> And um, I actually, thank you. I actually um, just, uh, I, we co-founded the African-American Redress Network in 2019. Um, it was a collaboration between Justin Hansford, um, Professor Justin Hansford at Howard University's Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center. And then, uh, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Um, the collaboration was formed in a, a response to a sense of an uptick in local and municipal level reparation efforts that were happening across the country. Um, let me just kind of situate that for you because this is not just a state um, a United States phenomenon. This is an international phenomenon. Starting in the 1990s, we began to see an uptick across the globe on very pointed reparation efforts at the local and state level. Um, and, and also in, within countries as well, but very localized, more of a micro-local effort. 
So in 2019, we formed the Redress Network initially as a mapping project. We just started doing an ArcGIS project. It was a very strategic uh, research project in which we um, explored what were the efforts in the United States specifically to address these historical um, wrongdoings within the United States. And the mapping actually took about three years. Um, we framed that mapping within an international human rights framework. So we were looking at five categories of repair. This is somewhat in alignment with um, the NARC uh, model, which has 10 points of repair. And I can put that in the chat for you. But the five points of repair are as follows satisfaction, restitution, rehabilitation, compensation, and guarantees of non-repetition. So what does that exactly mean? Satisfaction is something like an apology and acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Restitution is actually giving back. Rehabilitation is physical and mental health uh, services. Uh, Compensatory, of course, is what people often think about with reparations. That would be monetary reparations. And then the last one would be guarantees of non-repetition. So we began mapping the United States to get a sense of what was happening. And what we uncovered was that there were over 460 efforts across the United States. From that, we began to reach out to those communities. We simply sent emails and made phone calls and said, look, we understand we, we've, um, we've mapped you using this framework. We understand that you're advancing racial redress in your communities, and we'd like to engage with you. Um, and from that, we began actually walking alongside communities in their repair efforts. Um, in some communities, we've been able to do more than others um, due to mostly capacity. So what I would like to do is maybe talk to you a little bit about what that process has looked like when we have been deeply engaged with those communities. So I'm going to give you an example of efforts that we did in Chicago in 20, it's 2024 and 2022. So what that looks like is actually, um, and this is very important, particularly for the white individuals on this call or non-Black POC members, is that you do not enter into e efforts at the community level unless you were invited in. Um, it's very important that you take the lead from the communities and the descendant communities that are leading this work. They have been the knowledge experts for years, and they know what harms they have endured, and they also know what kind of repair they are, would like to advance. So when we began to work in Chicago, we were invited to work alongside two communities in Chicago, Inglewood and West Garfield. And we worked with um, Bubba Cam Howard, who used to be with Cobra and now has his own organization. And we spent a lot of time um, in community with him. So um, Cam Howard brought our students and myself to Chicago, and we spent a lot of time talking to the community organizations that were advancing repair initiatives already. These were organizations, descendant organizations, that were looking at historical harms around discrimination. They were looking at historical harms around housing. They were looking at historical harms around over-policing. They were looking at historical harms around education. And they were already advancing work within these areas. And so we spent a lot of time listening truly just listening to the work that they were doing and understanding how they were advancing this work. And then we spent time with people that were in the government, talking and listening to what options might exist. And through those processes, we began to merge some ideas of what repair might look like based on the voices of the community members. 
So there was a three-pronged research effort that we participate with in Chicago and any other community we do work with. And the first one is a historical analysis of harms, pointedly addressed at harms. You're trying to demonstrate exactly how these harms were um, implemented, what that looked like, um, were these housing discriminatory zoning policies that were passed by the municipality? Were these racial covenants put forth by real estate companies? Um, are we looking at a freedman community in which they're dealing with enslavement history and the erasure of their communities over time? Um, are we looking at the loss of cemeteries, the loss of historical artifacts? Um, and sites of significance. The second piece is to actually then do an impact analysis. So the impact analysis, you're creating a through line from the historical harms to contemporary impacts. There are several different frameworks that you can use for that. Um, we happen to use at the time of Chicago, the social determinants of health. The social determinants of health were developed by the World Health Organization in 2005 or six. And basically it's a very comprehensive way of looking at harm. It really gives you a totality of, of how these historical harms are impacting health today. So that does include looking at education, looking at health, looking at housing, looking at safety. Um, and then from that, a through line to reparative justice. So what would the policies be that would be implemented that would respond to those historical harms in the impacts? And what might already exist within the policy arena that will respond to that? Um, that's the process that we undertake with each community that we work with and it's a pretty comprehensive very intense research practice it takes a lot of time because and i want to bring it back to working with communities because it's not necessarily about us leading the research but about working in collaboration with the community to perform the research so let me give you an example of why that matters and where where it um, showed up when we were in Chicago. So when we were doing the impact analysis and utilizing that framework, the social determinants of health, we looked at public data sets. One public data set that looked specifically at walkability stated that these communities had above average walkability. Well, what was the public data set analyzing walkability on? sidewalks, uh, open space, um, crossroads. But we spent time in the community and in reality, um, these communities were so disinvested that there was a significant amount of reliance on the um, on on the economy uh the informal economy um there was a tremendous amount of um unrest between communities um there was violence um and in reality those communities had to create a program to accompany students to school because there was not safe there's not a safe way to for the students to get from home to school because of the disinvestment the over the the informal economy the lack of safety within the community and yet the walkability by the public data set said this is this is a pretty good walkability community so that kind of shows you the disparity between public data sets and the reality of what might be experienced within these communities. Probably the public data sets were gathered by the government. Maybe they had a drone, flew over, looked at sidewalks, looked at crossways, looked at maps and said, yeah, there's walkability here, but didn't really spend time in the community to understand the reality of what was faced on the ground floor. So 
that's why the engagement with the communities, having the communities lead you on the research, having the communities inform you of really what these data sets um, might look like for, for them um, is incredibly important to doing that impact analysis. Um, so that's the work we do. Um, we have spent a lot of time in community and we do a lot of training with our members before we even go into community. I talked to you about being invited into the community. And I will just say to you that there's a lot of training we do with the students now on specifically on a uh, cultural humility. And I raise that up because a lot of times and traditionally in the research world, um, institutions would go into communities and they would extract data. So they would go in and they say, well, why is it that there's poverty here? And they would spend time and extract data and then they would leave and they would do a report and you know get funding from the university or from a grant company to be able to do a grant foundation, to be able to do that research and infuse back into the institution themselves. We don't operate that way. Instead, um, we do a lot of training, particularly with our, our non-Black um, students, people of color that are not from the descendant, um, African-American descendants um, who are also white, like myself. And we do a lot of training on cultural humility. So cultural humility is actually a process um, oftentimes used with indigenous communities in which you, really reassess your own culture and really go into communities to engage in very deep listening. And so it's a practice we work with the students. We have a lot of training that we do with them, a lot of questioning and really, really looking at their own personal um, biases, their own personal racial biases and um in the ways in which they identify community and how they perceive community and what should be normalized um also as a university we go into communities and we do not um we do not take the funds for our own purposes instead we utilize the funds to pay for community liaisons so for instance when we work in africatown alabama let's say um and if we receive funding, we actually pay for community liaisons to help do that work I was talking to you about in Chicago that Cam did, connecting the researchers, the students and myself and other researchers to the community, to guide them through the process, to be the knowledge producers. We actually, instead of thinking about extraction, we think about going to communities and learning from the knowledge experts, the knowledge experts being the community members, being the community organizations that are leading the work. Um, there's a research terminology for that. It's called desired-based research. But again, it just looks at these communities and recognizes that they have been already engaged in Black liberation. They've already been engaged in self-emancipatory praxis, and they are the knowledge producers and that truly our role is to come in and to help increase capacity and to be able to create uh, research documentation that will help in the process of what they've already been doing on the ground floor. Um, and so those are just some of the ways in which we are very careful about how we enter into communities to make sure that we are not re-traumatizing um, and not extracting as traditional research institutions have. So those are some of the highlights of the work that we do. Um, but I really am interested in knowing what would be a benefit to this group. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. What I can tell you is that, um, and just in one other quick bit of information, we did a second mapping just recently. Um, and in the last, well, since 2020, we mapped another 141. So on top of the 460, 
we mapped another 141 efforts in the United States. And these ones were specific, not micro local necessarily. These were specific policies practiced at the municipal or state level as truth telling commissions or task force. So that's been another change, a pivot in the efforts in the United States in the last four years of an, a tremendous increase in truth telling and in reparation task force. Uh, did you, were you ready for questions or? Oh, sure. Yes, please. Okay. Mr. English. Hey, glad you can make it in. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate all the information you gave us tonight. Um, you did some very good in-depth evaluations. And I would I would have to say that um it's very much needed, you know what I mean? Because um this is a part of our agenda now, and um it's good that you know those analyses are being broke down. Um, the question I would have, well, I'll have like a kind of like a two-part question. Um, okay, so for example, um, taking a look at uh, those municipal and state level uh, uh, initiatives so far, uh, I'm pretty sure that you've got them ranked in name. So um, could you, could you like, for example, could you give a top 10 ranking? You know what I mean? On, um, you know, for example, mm -hmm how strong the initiative is and, you know, I mean, just your evaluation of what the, the work you did for, you know, and getting the research for those initiatives and, you know, just kind of give us a top 10 play on that. And then also, um, could you give us kind of a reason why those top 10 are kind of visible right now and in, in, in what they're doing as far as their reparations initiatives? Sure. Um, so I actually just put in the chat the mapping of the most recent truth telling and um, task force. And before I answer your question, I do want to give a shout out to Amani. I do want everyone to know that one of the things we are working on is actually something that Imani brought up. Um, and I'm going to give you the other initial map that we did with the 460 plus efforts. Um, one of the problems that we experienced in the data collection was that most uh, media presents this from a white perspective about how uh, the university is doing this or the city is doing that. Um, and a lot of the media is void of the actual grassroots um, and descendant-led efforts that are happening. And it's definitely a problem in the data because in reality, behind like the Georgetown University, let's say as an example, was a huge effort by the descendant group to advance that. And if you haven't seen the cost of inheritance, which just came out and it kind of highlights this, and I would love to know your thoughts on this, um, Imani, um, but initially, um, the university created a working group that was absent of any descendants, um, and yet it was descendants and it was students that advanced the call for that. So I just want to really situate this, like most of these communities that are advancing municipal task force whatever it is that they might be advancing it's really stemming from descendant and community um, organizing and that's very very important so you might hear about georgetown but let me just tell you there is a, a whole group of people behind that that is making the noise to get georgetown to respond um everybody also i want to say linda linda is calling me imani because that's my nickname but this is robin proudy y'all probably like who is imani so yeah that's I'm sorry me from the, that's okay <laughs> linda that's okay yeah that's me from the descendants of the st louis university and slave thank you just want to let everybody know that i will call you robin from now on for this meeting um thank you robin 
As far as rating, I will just say that that's a really complicated question. So let me give you some realities to the policy making that's happening in the United States. So probably one of the biggest issues is that a lot of these initiatives, these task force are being passed without funds. So there's a book called The Black Tax. If for those of you that aren't familiar with it, you should definitely research the concept of the black tax, which basically is a concept that with uh, that oftentimes black individuals in the United States are doubly taxed. And I would say that that is happening in some of these reparation task force. So just imagine the following. A city passes a task force and they task the descendant community to do the research I just talked to you about. Do your historical analysis of harms, do an impact analysis, and come up with some reparative justice processes that we should implement in the, in the city. But oh, by the way, we're not giving you any money to do that. And you have 18 months to do it. That's ludicrous, but it's happening. And it's pretty common. So how many of you on this call have heard that New York passed a reparations task force? And how many of you know that there are zero dollars behind that baby? So the congressman is, the senator is running around trying to do community engagement on zero money. Wow. How are you going to, you know, how is that going to look? Is he raising, is he going to have to raise money? Um, you know, this is what's happening. We are engaging with Kansas City this semester. They have a reparations task force. They have zero dollars. Detroit has money. Detroit has a task force and Detroit has money. About a half a million, I think. Boston has about a half a million. So I would say one of the number one ratings that we do is do, does it have money behind it? Because you cannot ask community members and most of these task force are predominantly descendants or survivors. Because I will say to municipalities um, credit, they have listened to the fact that the community members should be leading this work. But they're not putting money behind it. So again, this is the black tax. This is a double tax to the communities that have already endured harms, who are now supposed to put together these big reports and have a timestamp on it and are receiving nothing in return. A good task force should pay the members of the commission to be on that and should also provide research funds. Now, I'm not stating that the research funds should go to an organization like ourselves. Like we don't, we, we're working in Kansas City for $0. We're not going to do that. But if the government does put aside money to support research, then obviously it is fine for the task force to hire somebody. So I can tell you Detroit has hired the University of Michigan to do their historical analysis based on the harms around housing. Um, the other thing is that I will tell you, we spent 90 minutes yesterday on with uh, members in the West Coast. We have regional meetings on reparations efforts and ARN oversees the West and the South and then First Repair, which is Robin Rue Simmons from Evanston. Her organization oversees the Midwest and the East. So in our West meeting the other day, which um, includes San Francisco, includes Sacramento, Los Angeles, Denver, 
uh, San Antonio, um, Texas, those are just to name a few, with individuals who are actually involved in government policies and practices. So they are advancing task force efforts in their own government. These are government officials. We had almost a 90 minute conversation about the inability to get enough agreement across the aisle to support the concept of reparations. And that many of these municipal efforts are having to re are having to use a different term. So redress or restorative justice or um, re uh, I'm, tr I'm forgetting what the other term was. And basically on that call, there was a conversation about the fact that it was better to, to reterm what they were doing because the need to advance the policy is greater than holding on to the term reparations. Reparative so, justice is that? Uh, yeah, that one. I'm, no, I mean they try to stay. Robin, so it, reparative justice was brought out, but it was harms, harms. Um, there was something about harms. I'd have to look at my notes, but they were using different terms. Yeah. Um, restorative justice was definitely one of them. Redress is definitely more palpable. Historical harms. Historical harms. Yeah. And so I, I only bring that forward to you because as, if you're involved in some of these municipal decision making, you know, at the end of the day, I, I'm not sure what the great decision is to to do on this. Um, I'm simply giving you a data point. Um, I pushed back in that meeting because I will tell you that our steering committee is predominantly um, descendant led. So unlike most university steering committees, we're like 40% academia and 60% descendant community members, um, legacy legacy members as well, like people from Encobra and NARC and Black Lives Matter. And there was a comment made in one of our meetings about their frustration about, because we initially called ourselves the Redress Network, right, about not using the term reparations. And this particular descendant was like, why don't you just call it what it is? Why do we have to sugarcoat this? Why do we have to tiptoe around this? This is what it is. And so I give you that response to juxtapose between the conversation in the West about not being able to advance it because of that name. So there's this tension that's happening in the United States about wanting to get policy across the line, but you know, this, this tension about calling it reparations. And with that in mind, I would just say to you that New Jersey actually has a campaign called Say the Word Reparations. There's an entire campaign. I'll also put that in the chat for you. Um, so this is this is some of the stuff that's happening that's really causing um, tension. I will say probably one of the best advanced efforts is probably Amherst, Massachusetts, and I would encourage you all to look at the work that they've done there, which has been very, very well received and um, very thorough, very, you know, excellent community engagement, um, raised money, uh, etc. Um, I'm from St. Paul in the Rondo community, which has been getting a lot of attention uh, regarding like reparations. And um, one thing that they created was Rondo descendant, um, like a loan to help um, Rondo's descendants become homeowners. And my name, I applied for that because I have Rondo descendant ties. My family um, was a part of this community and influential um, when it was first building. And when I applied, I noticed that 
it does not really apply to us black people. And what I mean by that is um, they're going based off of the 1950 and 1960 census. And a lot of um, African-American black people did not participate in that. And then they're also going off of phone directories. So if your Rondo descendant elder family member did not participate in that, then you automatically don't qualify. They also do not um, acknowledge any Rondo descendants that were renters, which there were a lot of black renters because they were unable to own the home and they rent and white families rented to them. So technically that Rondo descendant home ownership loan really applies to the white owners during that time. <laughs> and I have yet to meet any black person that has received um, the loan yet. And um, everyone I spoke to has had issues the same. So I'm actually in the process of trying to get more data. Um, I'm known just because I, I do, I am younger and come from the generation of social media. So I do like to ruffle up feathers by going in on social media and I tag everybody. I will tag the superintendent, I'll tag the mayor and just call them out for what it is. But for this, I've kind of been holding back to just get more data and research and get a better understanding. So when I do speak, I'm not just out here um, speaking off emotions, but having historical data, like what you're saying. So, um, and really proving the historical harms. So um, thank you for the things you shared. I definitely took my notes and um, everything's God's timing because I, did not know what this meeting was about, to be honest. I just seen it pop up in my emails and I almost didn't come <laughs> because I just got done teaching a class. I just came back from Orlando, literally in the middle of the night. So I'm like tired and I have four boys. So I still have to be mom and uh, make sure that is taken care of. But when I seen the reparations part, I was like, okay, I need to go to this meeting. So now that I'm here and hearing everything, I'm like, oh, God is literally giving me help to just navigate this situation. So thank you guys. Hey, can I jump right in real fast? I just want to jump in Mercedes because you've made a good point. Um, I am also uh, American descendant of channel slavery um, that was born in that Rondo neighborhood in the early 70s. So um, I did apply for the same funding program that you're talking about. Um, I did receive some movement on it and I wanted to leave my email address in the, in the, in the uh, chat so you can, uh, we can kind of touch base because um, I did receive some movement on it. Um, I know other uh, black folks as well who have received movement on it, but there's a conversation to that and I'll discuss it with you later. Um, and, and again, um, I just wanted to um, just add real quick that, um, yes, I can completely understand that, um, you know, um, when it comes down to um, redress and harm, um, those are, you know, those are terms that um, will definitely logistically work. But I think the key piece to the key piece to um, the whole start was, um, you know, the reparations base. You know what I mean? So you can't have, for example, compensation, restitution, guaranteed of non-repetition and uh, satisfaction all together in one bunch. I don't think um, unless it's tied completely together with the term reparations. And I think that's, you know, that's going to be here to stay. You know what I mean? No matter, you know, how they want to switch it around. They can't stop it right now at this point. So um, I think, you know, with those committees, you know what I mean? I mean, with those other commissions. I think they kind of uh, decided a route to go with. And um, uh, could you kind of discuss more um, about, uh, for example, the different routes that you can go with with those terms and then still using the term reparations? Um, sure. I mean, uh, well, 
Somebody asked, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to answer that and also answer a question that's in here. Do you ever talk about basing reparations in the tort model? So the tort model is solely focused on the compensation aspect of it and demonstrating harm. And yes, you know, that is something that is, has been used before. That was traditionally the way that the U.S. situated um, repair. Um, now that said, um, I will say to you that that in the, at least in the international arena, compensation is not seen actually as something that can really bring total repair. It's a piece of it, but it does not provide complete and whole repair. And in the international framework, you really need all five categories in order to have complete and total repair. So what does that look like? I'll give you an example in Virginia. Um, in Virginia, there was a community, um, well, there were several communities, there were five communities that were shut out of school um, during massive resistance in the Commonwealth of Virginia. What was massive resistance? Massive resistance was actual government policies that were implemented first by Virginia and then by a lot of the Confederate, the previous Confederate states, mm -hmm. to deny the desegregation of schools as mandated by Brown v. Board. In the Commonwealth of Virginia, they were so strategic that they first, that one of the biggest things that they, first of all, they combed the, um, they combed the, the Virginia laws, the constitution, and they did one very significant thing. They repealed compensatory education. Okay. So you did not have to go to school. Then what the municipalities did was they stated, well, if we don't have to go to school, we don't have to provide school. Right. And what they did was they completely shut down public schools and then they successfully siphoned a portion of property taxes to pay for white only private schools so that there were no schools in the community for black students. Mm. This happened, this continued from 1959 to 1964 in one particular community. Um, not until 2001 did this history come back forward. Oh, let me just let me just close that up. 1964 it opened back up a Supreme Court case actually that was that was founded based on this site in Farmville, Virginia. And that Supreme Court stated that it was under the federal constitution that stated that states were required to private provide public schools and therefore they needed to open back up. So that's why they opened back up in 1964. But this history was never talked about when they opened back up the schools. I want you to imagine thousands of students who were denied an education for five years and the impact of that was, um, was monumental. Education deprivation for five years, 75% were struggled with literacy, um, many of them did not go back to school. Uh, many of them had gotten jobs in the interim. Um, those students that were like, say, seven when the schools closed and came back almost 13 dropped out. Um, so this was a staggering impact to the community. So finally in 2000, uh, they're going to raise the school. They're going to raise the black only school that was the site of this whole turmoil around public education and the black community organized and created a campaign first to save that school site as a historic site and then to work with government officials to do something about this history the first thing that happened in 2003 the commonwealth of virginia acknowledged the wrongdoing they actually put forth a statement of regret 
I will let you know, for those of you that are interested in legal terms, they didn't say that they are apologizing. Because when you apologize in legal terms, you are then res potentially responsible for compensation and the Commonwealth was protecting themselves. So they said they regret. But then the next thing that they did was they actually passed a scholarship. I asked one question to you. Hey, Jeremy, mute yourself, please. Sorry. Um, what they actually ended up doing following that was they created a scholarship program. So they did create some kind of compensation. They actually provided funds for these students who had been denied to go back to school. Then, so they've got satisfaction. Now they've got compensation. They then, then did memorialization. They created a magnificent memorial that you can see in Richmond, Virginia. Um, they have now provided those funds to the next generation. Uh, they've now done what we would consider some form of guarantees of repetition. They've created curriculum. It's required in the Commonwealth of Virginia for students to know this, this history. Um, and so that is an example of a little bit different than what you would normally think as far as compensatory, but they had compensation, guarantees of non-repetition, they um, restitution, restoring the, the education of those that were denied, giving it to the next generation, which is another guarantee of re on repetition. You're, you're eradicating that literacy issue and the uh, statement of a regret and memorialization. Uh, thank you. Is there, does anybody else have a question? I know, Robin, you had your hand up. Hmm. I had a question about, um, I think we had spoken, then we were talking about archiving, but a way to have the community do it. Yeah, so um, two th quick things on that. Um, that's how Evanston passed theirs. They, Dino Robinson created Shorefront Legacy, first starting out with oral histories, and then by collecting and preserving um, Black community archives. Much of that data is hidden in communities, particularly stuff from the civil rights, because that was information that you didn't want to have let out. Um, and so that's, I would say, to look at Shorefront Legacy. Um, I will also say that I actually do ARN um, as part of my work at Columbia as a adjunct assistant professor, but my full-time job is actually at George Mason University. And we just embarked on a national art for what is known as ARCH. So it's Archive for Racial and Cultural Healing. Um, and that is a specific effort that is being led for freedmen communities on community-based archiving. And what that program does is goes into communities and helps communities archive their documents. Um, I don't have like, this isn't really a question. It's more of like, just wanting to know your perspective. So in the St. Paul Rondo community, and I also noticed with North Minneapolis around Broadway, um, what they're doing is using the history to gain funding, but the funding is not beneficial or going to the community members. So there's multiple organizations like Rondo Land Trust Fund and like Reconnect Rondo and just different things that are really pushing the narrative of like, we're doing this for the community. And some of them do have good intentions and I see how it is helping, but others are, I feel like, are just using the Rondo name to gain funding and access to whatever their agenda is. But um, 
I've attended and in a part of a lot, a lot of these meetings and they say that they want the community's input. And when I go, I'm one of the people that speak up on like what I'm saying now. So I noticed they don't invite me back to the meetings, but um, I know people at the meeting, so they keep inviting me. So it's just funny because every time I show back up, the people who are running the organizations are looking at each other like, how would she know about this? Why is she here? And um, so how, yeah, I'm just in, wondering, like, is that common where people are going into certain communities and using the history to gain attention or momentum for their specific projects, but are not necessarily from the community or really for the community? I'm, I'm shaking my head because unfortunately that's the reality of most institutions and organizations. Um, I, I commented a little bit about that when I was talking about universities in general and the general way in which many institutions come into communities and uh, and um, you know take information and utilize it for their own well-being <laughs> and to prosper from actually right um, and it's a problem. Um, one of the things is that we have to, you know, there's always resource guarding. And so part of it is resource guarding. Part of it is also concepts of hierarchy and, you know, that this organization has this expertise. Can you guys still hear? Sometimes we call that gremlins. Oh, there she go. There she go. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. My apologies. Um, no, I was just saying, unfortunately, that's the reality of many institutions and also the concepts of the ways in which institutions are very colonialized and imperialistic and hierarchical. And instead of looking at the communities as the experts, they feel like they have a space to make a move in this. And so they do. Um, I'm going to send Trey, I'll send you our toolkit that we just came out, which talks about how allies should enter into the space and work with communities. It comes from our years of, ex of working alongside descendant communities and survivor communities. And I would say share that with them. <laughs> And then I do want to respond to um, Jamal. Is it Jamala? Jamila. Jamala. Um, yeah, so that's a problem. There's no question about it. And actually, that example I gave you in Virginia, they, they gave scholarships to only the people that stayed in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And the mockery of that was that a lot of people left the state when the schools were closed in order to get an education elsewhere and never came back. And yet it still impacted them greatly. Some of them still dropped out. I mean, it was an incredible undertaking to, you know, imagine being 12 and being moved to New Jersey to continue your, your education. Um, and so unfortunately, a lot of institutions don't do that though, because there's limitations on how their funding can be distributed within their own institution. And so a lot of times you'll see this very focused on specifically those that remain in the area because of institutional structures and boundaries. I want to, I, um, I have a question or kind of a comment that, um, kind of relates to what Mercedes and Jamila uh, um, are talking about. People have left the area, or some people were forced to leave the area because they couldn't afford to live in St. Paul anymore, or because like the Rondo, um, the freeway came through and it, it dispersed uh, communities. 
And then, so I think when she talked about West Broadway, um, they're having a conversation in Minneapolis about building a, a light rail project that will go uh, through West, the black community and displaced communities, even as we're talking about what happened to Rhonda. So um, I, I was just wondering about, and I'm, I know this with highways and people being displaced, it's a similar story across the country. I think even I see this, a conversation that's happening here with Mercedes brought up. I read an article from Detroit and they had, and there were some community members with some of the same concerns. Yeah, I mean, displacement is, is uh, yeah, I just spent all day today in a community, another community in Virginia, Brown Grove. Um, I, I don't I actually think that I've ever, I mean, this is sad to say, but I don't think there's any black community that was founded at the turn of the 20th century that hasn't dealt with significant displacement. Um, it, you don't have to think too deeply about it. It's not far, far a far cry. Um, and if you want to read a very academic book on it, read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. But essentially at the turn of the 20th century, we're, we're in the midst of the Gilded Age. We're going from rural to industrial. At the same time, we're at the height of Jim Crow and black coats. So how are cities designed? They are designed segregated. Every single solitary urban planner went into a city and designated segregated spaces. Now they didn't call that that because there had been a Supreme Court ruling about, about zoning a couple of years before then, but by the 1915, 19, yeah, but by the 1950, urban planners were using the term blight as a way to refer to black and brown communities. And so what happened in these cities, in these urban planning, is that the blight, the black and brown communities were segregated, and then they were zoned commercial and industrial. So how did that impact down the road? Well, they got bifurcated by highways they got industrial development in the backyard. They got paper mills, oil refineries, railroad tracks. Uh, so you had a lot of commercial development, industrial development that they ended up having to leave. Then as um, racial, as, as, as urban developing and the in, in it more towards like the 60s and 70s, you begin to have those areas taken over, gentrified, and then the cost of housing becomes expensive, and then they move people out again. So there's layers of this displacement that's happened across the United States. And if people haven't left, um, most of those communities that remain are, are the recipients of unbelievable environmental injustice. Cancer Alley um, would be an example. Jane, I know you put um, something in the chat. Did you want to address it? The, the, the information I put in the chat, Trey. I, I, I'm concerned that St. Paul to date has done so many of the right things. I mean, our, our commission is a permanent commission. It's not a short-term task force. Um, we haven't put money behind it. I'm a former city council person, except to hire a staff person and also um, to use the resources of the St. Paul City Council to, to do the work of the commission. So that would include research and um, other kinds of analysis. 
but I just I just rolled off the council and we still haven't hired a staff person for the commission, which has been a very controversial issue on the community. And and I'm concerned about the issues that Mercedes has brought up about the fact that the Rondo Inheritance Fund gives the appearance of being some kind of a reparations program, but it was developed completely outside of our reparations work. So um, I think the, the Reparations Commission, which as I say, remains to be seated because we don't have a staff person yet, is getting painted with that um, failure of the inheritance fund not going to the right people when the commission hasn't actually been seated yet. So the a lot of the frustrations and and I I really Linda I I'm so glad you're with us tonight because I mean you kind of you you clearly understand you know when people are kind of saying all the right things but then not performing and cities and elected officials getting credit for things that that look like they're meant to move in the right direction but but they're not so i i mean basically i just wanted to be able to respond to my own frustration and disappointment with the way our reparations efforts have been stymied in st paul but the good news is that we passed an ordinance that um, came out of a, a really good process that creates a permanent commission. So we are not gonna be able to just um, scuttle the work of a, of a temporary task force. And, um, and we, have a, we have to be accountable to the fact that we are going to ultimately seat this commission and they are going to get to really hold the city accountable. They have to hold the city's feet to the fire to make this as important as it has the potential to be. Yeah, and I, I don't mean to be discouraging and so, First of all, I think that's really important, the fact that you have a commission that doesn't sunset. Um, just think about California. I mean, all eyes were on California. All eyes are still on California. We're waiting to see what will happen, if at all. But one of the things that was discussed by members is that that's, that commission sunset two days after the report. So you had maybe three members on the California task force that we were had positions within the government, but that's it to usher that through out of the entire task force. Everything was dis dismembered after that. Um, think about Asheville. Asheville was the first, one of the first ones on the scene. They still have not followed through with the funding, with the money on that is they are still playing, I don't know. I don't know what that game is called, but remember we used to put the shells, the turtle shells, the money's here, the money's here, the money's Great here. The money's here. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what's happening in Asheville, North Carolina. So accountability, follow through. I mean, this is why the commissions really need to have descendant community majority. That doesn't mean you don't have, look, we have got to figure out a way in this country to walk through these processes together. That doesn't mean that I lead it, but that I have a lane as a white person. I have a lane in this. Right. I have a responsibility in this. My lane is one of listening, learning, supporting, advancing, speaking up, right? But I am not going to lead the effort. I can't speak for the community. I haven't endured these. I've, I will never know what it is to be black in this country. And so that is not my lane. But as a white person, I have a lane. I have a responsibility. I have an obligation. 
So somehow or other, we have to figure out how to create these commissions where leading are the black communities and the organizations and the members who have experienced and already know how to do repair. How many, I don't even need to say this to this group, but in every community, in every predominantly black and brown community, there are black led community organizations filling the gaps where the government has failed them. Mm -hmm. They already know how to do this work. Right. When I talked to you about Chicago at the very beginning, our recommendations were to put in place a reparative basic income because Chicago had passed a GBI. We said to, to instead actually name it reparative basic income and focus it on these black communities that they had disinvested in. Mm -hmm. And then tie their experience as they were receiving funds to the skill-based programs that were already fully operational in the black communities. They already had programs for recidivism. They already had programs for tech. They already had programs for healthcare and food. So you didn't have to go elsewhere and recreate it. It was already there. Well, I, I feel, I mean, overall, I feel hopeful, partly because what we know is, is that whether people like the word reparations or not, it's now a household word. People are talking about it. And that, I mean, that's the beginning of, of progress. But the other thing is, I think, as white allies, we have to call the bullshit. I mean, we really have to call <laughs> the bullshit. You don't get, you don't get to pass a, a, an ordinance in St. Paul seven to nothing with all of the council members after George Floyd signing on as sponsors of the of the ordinance of the law and then let them get away with not hiring a staff person and not seating the commission a year later. So we, I mean, I, I, I think the message that I'm taking away from tonight is is a really positive one because honestly, Linda, when you said 460 programs and then 121 more, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a groundswell and it's frustrating and everything is going to try to stop us from making this happen. But I, I think it's past the point of, of being able to make it go away. I, I, re I really, really feel that it's headed in the right direction. And, and I loved what you said, as Mercedes noted, white people need to be invited into these efforts. But whether we are or not, we've got to call the bullshit. If we're not at the table trying to get reparations in our communities, we've got to say, you pass this damn ordinance. You can't disassociate yourself from it. And let and let the next round of elected officials just say, "Oh well, that was that was that that was that previous group, and we're kind of we have a permanent commission." So anyway, I'll shut up about it. But this has just been a great conversation because I think that looking at that map and looking at the numbers, we're headed in the right direction, even if it's going to be hard to get there. I will commend St. Paul for having a permanent commission. I, I that's not normal. I will tell you that. So good on good on you. And isn't there a church? There's a church coalition that was looking at reparations as well. Minnesota Council of Churches. Churches, yeah, yep. yeah. And and they, we met with them. Trey, you probably know more about them than I haven't kept up with it. But the first thing they did was they reconfigured their board so that the majority of the board members of the Minnesota Council of Churches are black clergy. That was their first act was to say, hmm. it's not just those of us who are in power now, we are changing who's in power. I'm so impressed by that. And let me just say one thing. So Mercedes, I think asked this before and I'm sorry, she's not 
here, but please share this with her. So one of the things that institutions are often advancing, they're like, oh, well, we're going to decolonize ourselves. We're going to decolonize ourselves. And what we're going to do, and I'll give you an example of foundations, right, is foundations are now going to give, we're going to create an arm now where we give money for racial redress. But they don't change their structure. And if they don't change their structure, they're just going to continue to to redo the same kinds of harms. They've got to change their own structure. When I was talking to you about the students and doing the cultural humility, that's part of our undoing. Like we're stripping ourselves of how we perceive things and trying to decolonize our mind because we have been so like hierarchy, white people, la la, that you have to you have to almost it's almost um what do they call that when you um like if you were in a cult deprogram or something <laughs> yeah you have to deprogram you have right. to deprogram yourself and then you have to change the structures of the organization so that they do business differently so i really commend the um council of the churches for doing that in minnesota it's a phenomenal step forward there's a lot written about that that we have to do the structural change first and then we can do effective repair and you know one other thing that that i worry about with all of this is when we when we see the commission in saint paul and we and i i have not met all the commissioners but there are several on this call and i am so impressed with them but to expect and and actually i believe that our entire commission ended up being african-american am i right on that trey um i know there was an effort there were applicants that were um that were diverse but i believe that we ended up seating a full commission or we haven't seated them yet but the selected a commission that was entirely african-american and i and and one thing i worry about is that the city isn't going to train them in terms of how much power they have or what they're capable of doing i mean these are people who may or may not have served on other boards or commissions or depending on their professional backgrounds and experience to be able to withstand the immediate political pr pressure that will be put on them to be within kind of reasonable parameters um i mean it's it's something that i think the system has has always been good about or has always made that effort to have the boards and commissions look diverse but there needs to be some kind of training or or permission or something given to say do not get put in a box do not get get um reduced to being what the city council wants you to be and that is a really easy trap to fall into, including for elected officials who get elected to bodies that they suddenly find themselves in this group of people where there are certain rules. And I guess I better adhere to these because people don't necessarily seem to be speaking up when stupid things are said. So somehow, I mean, we've got some strong people on the commission and I, and I feel hopeful that that won't happen but that is also part of it is just that that we truly empower the people who are placed on these bodies to do everything that they can to bring about change and can i just chime in real quick i um when she talked about universities or organizations um, especially white ones talking about the decolonizing themselves, kind of going through some of the things we just been through this year. I think that should also apply to the cities who are 
uh, trying to implement these processes. And I think that's why it's still a slow process because some of the cities still have a colonization mindset right. or a, a hierarchy. I'm not saying, I mean, there's going to be hierarchies, but it shouldn't be based off like race. And then if we're talking about um, the reason why I knew um, Mercedes is because we were in a, I was in a process where we had to look at people's applications, but we knew we were looking at black people's applications. So we said, you don't even have to write an application. You can send us a video or you can, you can send us like a seven minute video and then we'll determine if we're going to pick you or not, or you can write it out because we know black people have different ways of learning and, and things like that. So we were trying to decolonize that process. Um, but Lynn, uh, just real quick, or Bill, if one of you guys want to speak to, we know MCC has a great process going on, but also restorative actions has a great process uh, happening too. And uh, that's connected with the Presbyterian church. And I just, oh, uh, I'm honored to be find out last week that I'm a trustee uh, with restorative action. So uh, really excited about that. But if if one of you guys want to explain just real quickly, because we're running out of time, like a 60 minute um, splash for restorative actions. Thank you. There we go. There yeah, go. there we go. Um, yeah, Restorative Actions is the program that was set up by the Senate of Lakes and Prairies, Presbyterians. Uh, there were two trustee groups that were set up in order to do wealth transfer um, from a pool of, I think it was about um, 200 uh, Presbyterian uh, churches in uh, Minnesota and uh, the Dakotas, and the two trustee groups are, um, one is up, uh, Trey Hearn is on one of those groups, it's, um, it's all African American, um, deciding um, how to disperse those funds. We could talk about the eligibility, but um, that it, that it takes some more time. Um, the other group is uh, indigenous, um, folks that would be making distributions to um, entities in, in that group. Uh, we just talked about the Minnesota Council of Churches and their reparations activities. There's the Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light uh, group, which uh, has two tracks. Uh, one is a reparations curriculum that they've gone through and already presented that. And another is called Sacred Reckonings, where they're developing uh, reparation programs in uh, other uh, Christian denominations. On top of that, there's the uh, two denominations in Judaism, uh, the Reform and the uh, uh, Reconstituted uh, that have taken positions locally on reparations explicitly on reparations. So there's a lot of activity in the, the faith community. And the good news is that um, on top of all that, uh, the 22nd and 23rd of, uh, well, mostly on the 22nd, um, there's gonna be a discussion here um, in, in, the, in Twin Cities. Uh, you should have all gotten a flyer if you haven't. Uh, you know, come to the event on the 22nd and 23rd, and we'll get more information about all of that activity so that we can uh, develop a broader, um, more engaged movement. I'd like to also talk about Jim Bear Jacobs and Healing Minnesota Stories, which uh, Minnesota Council of Churches saw what he was doing and said, oh my gosh, we hope he'll join us. Jim Bear um, went into the Minnesota Council of Churches. He's infiltrated the Minnesota Council of Churches and he's making real change there. So we have to, we have to talk about Jim Bear Jacobs and his um, 
patented and he owns the copyright on the intellectual property that went into the Minnesota Council of Churches when he leaves there that goes with him so they're honoring that that's a really important feature of um, proper attributions I'll just say that and then I'll quiet down thank you and we'll let Linda hold us uh, take us out with the last four minutes no actually I would love Trey if Bill and Lynn, I would love to have links to the work that you're doing. Um, you're just um, reaffirming our data. I will tell you that from our mapping, faith-based organizations are leading this work across the country. Um, so it's a really interesting th thing to watch. Um, you know, and, and so I, I really, I really appreciate you sharing that. I would love to just kind of look at your work and see what's going on. Um, so if anybody could send that to me. And I, I mean, I'm not the one who should have the last word. Trey, you should have the last word. Um, so we are re really, thank you for being here. And um, I thought it was really important for you to come here and uh, talk, I think, uh, now that you've spoken, people understand why we really wanted you to come and have this discussion with us um, to address decolonizing organizations, but also our city governments who are taking on on this work also need to look um, within and start changing some of those structures. But I think that's some of the work that the commissions are going to have to do once we're allowed to get seated and start um actually do, doing the work um i know when we were in uh, illinois you i don't you said minnesota was in the top five as far as reparations work that's happening so we were really uh proud to hear about that but uh for for we'll be talking more february 22nd and the 23rd we're going to be at the hilton airport um we're cam howard who uh, Linda just spoke about who she works closely with and is doing great work in Chicago, really all over the nation, um, and has spearheaded the, the uh, a lot of the reparations work in movement. is going to be our keynote speaker um, for for that that conference. And um, one big thing he's working on that I think that our um, well, you just said something else that we want to think that our commission is going to get, but the. Um, slavery disclosure act i think that's going to be really important for cities um and even states to look at as as we start undertaking uh the the reparations um work at the local state and federal level but again that's um if you want to register you can go to www.blacklivesmattersmn.com and you'll see this picture uh we also have flyers out but click on that picture and then the Eventbrite will pop up and then you can register. We're, we're filling up uh, a lot faster than I thought we would. So please hurry up and register. It's gonna be a powerful event and we will definitely uh, be ready to represent Minnesota's reparatory justice movement. Um, thank you guys all for coming. We're gonna keep growing and having great um, facilitators like uh, Linda Mann, and also you can go to Linda Mann's website, that's African American Redress Network.org. Or is it dot com? It's just re redressnetwork.org. Super redress, simple. Yeah, redressnetwork.org. And they have a lot of great resources and tools on there. Uh thanks everybody. And we will uh see you February 22nd and 23rd. Have a prosperous rest of your month. Peace. Peace.